What's up YouTube? Have you ever wondered about the paintbrush tool in Affinity Photo on the iPad? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. Welcome back, my name is Ben Nielsen. I'm a media design educator, and today we're talking all about the paintbrush tool in Affinity Photo on the iPad. We've been systematically working our way through every tool in Affinity Photo on the iPad, and today it's all about the paintbrush tool. Now this is a really interesting tool because it's used in so many different ways by so many different types of creators. For example, someone who's focused on digital art and using Affinity Photo as a digital canvas will use the paintbrush tool in some ways almost exclusively in order to create that art, very much like you might use the brush tools inside of an app like Procreate. Whereas somebody who's working on photo compositing in Infinity Photo really was probably going to use the brush tools a lot more in terms of like using them to create masks and different effects. And so that is a completely different kind of use, but using the same tool. So there's going to be a lot to unpack in a tool this versatile. So let's go ahead and get started. But before we do that, I just want to remind you that I do have courses on Affinity Photo for the iPad, which will help you to learn how to use this program in different ways to do different types of creative work. So make sure that you check those out in the description below. They're down there with all of my other courses on different Affinity programs and other creative tools. Okay, let's go ahead, dive in and get started looking at the papers tool in Affinity Photo on the iPad. Okay, so the paintbrush tool is the seventh tool down on the left hand side and it looks like you would expect like an artist's paintbrush. Now you might notice that this is the first tool we have looked at that has a little arrow in the bottom right hand corner which indicates that there are more tools here than what we can see. If we tap on it a second time, we will see all the tools in this group. Besides the paintbrush, we also have the pixel brush, the paint mixer brush, and the color replacement brush. Today we are only looking at the paintbrush tool, but we will look at the other ones another time. The most obvious part of this tool is that once it's selected, you can use it to paint or draw on your layer, like this. Now you'll notice this note here where it says that the assistant added a new raster layer. So it will do that if you try and paint on something that's not already a raster layer. In this case, we only had the background, so the assistant added a new layer. We can see that in our layers panel. We now have this pixel layer here. So we need something to paint on, so I added it for us, which is really nice. I'm just going to go ahead and undo that stroke. But that is how you would use it to draw. Now, you will notice that with the paintbrush tool selected, we see a new context toolbar at the bottom of the screen. This gives us a bunch of controls for the brush, but it doesn't actually let us choose a different brush. For that, we need the brush studio on the right hand side. This is the brush studio, and this is where you could select a different brush. We're not going to worry about the brush studio in this video, but we will get to it another time. For now, we'll just focus on the controls in the context menu. Width is the first control, and it controls the size of the brush that you can paint with. So you can see right now I'm set to 68.9 pixels, and when I draw, I draw on this size. But if I go ahead and make that brush bigger by dragging to the right, it's going to get larger, and it's going to paint much larger. Now I could also make it smaller by dragging way down to the left, and then I can draw much smaller. So that's width. We're going to just go ahead and set it back to around 75. Let's undo those strokes. Next we have opacity. And opacity basically says how transparent the brush is. 100% where we are right now is completely opaque. So you can see what that looks like. Whereas if we take it down to like 50%, it will be half transparent. And if we take it all the way to zero, we won't be able to see it at all. I'm painting, but you can't see it because there is no opacity. So generally this will be at 100% opacity, but if you wanna kind of build up layers as you would with paints, then you can kind of adjust that based on what kind of paint you're trying to mimic. Go ahead and undo those strokes. Next we have flow. And currently we have flow set to 100. Flow determines how quickly the brush stamp is applied. A low flow number will result in more distance between each stamp, giving it a jitter feeling. Whereas a high flow number like we have now will have almost no distance between the stamps, giving a more streamlined feel like this. So you can see how that is. And then let's bring the flow down to around 50. And you can see that it's a little bit more jittery here. And then if we bring it way down, to like 10, you can see how that stamp is coming tick, 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 all the way along there. So that is flow. Let's undo those. Okay, lastly, in this kind of group here, we talk about hardness. And hardness is just how much paint there is on the edge of the brush, essentially. So when it's hard like this, as we've been seeing all along, there's a kind of a hard edge to it. But if we lower our hardness down, you can see it even shrinks kind of the size of the brush because 
there's going to be more space out here where it kind of fades out. And you can kind of see what this is going to look like in a little preview under this more circle. So you can kind of see based on white, gray, and black what's going to be showing. And if I drag hardness up, you'll see the white ring expand so that we have more of a moderate hardness there. And a lot of times you want hardness at 100%, but sometimes you won't depending on the effect that you're going for, especially when masking, you might not want your hardness to be all the way at 100%. You can also see that more circle respond to the opacity and to the size a little bit. Although once you get past 100, you can't really tell anymore. And also to the flow. You can see what's happening there. So that more is a good little indicator. Now that more button itself will actually open up this new window, which takes you into a lot more complex brush customization. So there's all kinds of different properties you can access in here, as well as the ones we've been accessing from the context menu. But this area is really outside of our scope. So we're just going to go ahead and hit cancel right now. But this is where you could go in and really customize the brush. Okay, next we have this protect alpha and protect alpha basically says that just don't paint anywhere that there are transparent pixels this is great if you have something that you're trying to recolor like a png or something that you've created in photoshop or another thing you've created in affinity and it has some kind of transparency to it then you can make sure you're only coloring on the actual pixels and not outside them all right next we have color this one's probably obvious but this gives you the color wheel or the other color options that you would have from the color studio and you can pick what color your brush is going to paint with. So if we wanted this to be green, we just drag it around and then we could start painting with green. Let's go ahead and go back to our magenta just so that shows up well. And then we have this force pressure setting and force pressure basically says that if you are working with the Apple Pencil or another force sensitive stylus, you can adjust the size and weight of your brush stroke based on your pressure. So if I do a very light pressure here, it'll be very thin. But if I do a very strong pressure, it will be thicker. And depending on the size of the brush, depends on how big I can go. So that's force pressure. Very useful if you're going for a very hand-drawn feel. All right, then we have wet edges. And wet edges will basically push more paint out to the edge of the brush. And it'll be more opaque on the edge and therefore more transparent in the middle, which is kind of like a watercolor effect. So this is it with wet edges. And then this is it without wet edges. And you can see that if we draw across, we can actually see the stroke go over the top of the wet edges. But if we draw it with wet edges, we can see the stroke go over and how they are being layered. That'd probably be easier with a different color. So let's go ahead and change this to green. And then you can see what happens here. So you can see how, because I have wet edges on, you can see through it. And when I have wet edges off, you can't. So that's basically wet edges. It gives you kind of a watercolor feel. It's of course gonna work better with a brush that's intended to have more of a watercolor feel than just kind of the standard round brush that we're using. All right, then we hit the little arrow and we go into the next menu here. Actually, I'm gonna lower my brush size a little bit before we do that, just so you can see this. So this is two menus, the stabilizer menu and the symmetry menu. And the stabilizer menu will basically try to smooth out your strokes. So right now we have no stabilizer, but we can turn this to rope stabilizer or window stabilizer. Let's try rope stabilizer first. Rope stabilizer is going to give us a little rope to drag with, and we can guide our stroke based on that. And it's going to try and smooth it out based on where we're going, but we can still draw sharp corners like this. This in contrast to the window stabilizer, which is going to average the area where we're drawing. So even if we try to draw sharp corners, it's much more difficult to, because we it's kind of trying to average out the area. But you can see you can draw sharp corners there, it's just more difficult. And this is based on how big the window is, so we can actually lower the window considerably. Let's show you what that looks like. So you can see it's smoothing things out there. So that is the stabilizer. Most of the time I set this to no stabilizer, but depending on what kind of artwork you're doing, you might want a stabilizer turned on. And next is a really cool one called symmetry. Turn on symmetry and you can see we have this line running across and a dot in the middle. Now we can drag that dot up and down and we can also adjust the rotation of the line. Then when we draw, it's going to draw in symmetry on both sides of the line, which is really very handy if you're doing something that needs to look the same on both sides. You also have the option, let's set this back to normal, to do mirror, so that it will actually mirror it on both sides instead of making it symmetry. 
And then we have this lines option and you can choose how many lines to do in symmetry. So let's just set this to two lines and you can see we get four areas. So you can do as many of those as you want. Good for drawing like mandalas. And then the last one is locked. And lock will basically lock that point so that you can't move it anymore. So you can see I can't drag on the line. I'm just going to draw when I'm on it. Can't change it. But when we unlock it, the point comes back and we can adjust it again. And that's it. That is the paintbrush tool in Affinity Photo on the iPad. If you're interested in Affinity Photo on the iPad, make sure you check out the rest of the playlist of all of the tools as we're going through this. Also, in the comments, let me know what things you use the brush tool for. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.